Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome, uh, welcome uh, to this great event that we have in the afternoon during lunchtime. So I re really appreciate everyone joining us um, during your busy schedules. I want to begin by welcoming back uh, Nitsana Darshan Leitner to the Jewish Center. I want to especially thank Emily Dauber for connecting us with Nitsana for this event and all of you for participating uh, today. You know, Sefer Vayikra, which we find ourselves uh, currently in, is all about elevating the mundane to the holy, lifting up the Jewish people to be unique among the nations. Right? The mitzvah of Kedoshim to you elevates us and from time immemorial has been the creed for our people. And yet it's that distinctiveness and that uniqueness that also has drawn the attention of the enemies of our people. Um, and over the generations for centuries, we often have not had a defense to turn to a military, a state, um, but now we are blessed, thank God, with a state, with an army, and with people like Nitzana who fight Israel's battles in the courtroom as well. Nitzana Darshan Leitner is an Israeli activist and lawyer, and she and her colleagues pioneer the strategy of combating terror financing, whether it's BDS and the multiple uh, lawfare, lawfare threats against the Jewish state by her enemies. As the president of the Tel Aviv-based civil rights organization, Shurat Hadin, Israel Law Center, She's represented hundreds of terror victims in legal actions against terrorist organizations and their supporters, and has won hundreds of millions of dollars in compensation on their behalf. Under the motto, bankrupting terrorism one lawsuit at a time, she and her associates are handling civil actions against Hamas, Islamic Jihad, the PLO, the PA, Hezbollah, Iran, and the list goes on. In recent years, she has initiated a legal campaign to deprive terrorists of social media resources, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And she recently won a major uh, victory against Airbnb for delisting Jewish homes in Judea, uh, Judea and Samaria. Mr. Sean Leitner is also nationally uh, known as the best-selling co-author of the book, the 2017 book, Harpoon, a link which I will post in just a few minutes. She's a graduate of the bar -Ilan University Law Faculty and holds an MBA from Manchester University. We're pleased to have Nitsana joining us for a presentation. Please feel free to chat me throughout the event uh, for questions that we will address toward the end um, of our event. At this moment, I'll turn things over to Nitsana. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm glad to be in the Jewish Center once again. And uh, this time in Zoom next year, uh, perhaps in your uh, hometown. Um, I would say Shurat Adin is, is a civil rights organization based in Israel that has taken Israel's enemies into the courtroom. We've been doing it since the uh, uh, early 2000s. And um, in this uh, lecture, perhaps I will tell you how we started and where we stand today. We started in the beginning of the Intifada, it was the year of 2000. Israel called to a special military call up because the Intifada just broke out. There were suicide bombings and drive-by shootings and uh, uh, shooting events on a daily basis. And two soldiers have made their way to their base, but they didn't know their way so well and they made a mistake. They, made the uh, wrong turn into the uh, city of Ramallah. In Ramallah, which is a major city in the Palestine Authority, they were pulled out of their car, they were brought to the police station in town. Very quickly, the rumor was spread that there are two Israeli soldiers arrested in the Palestinian police station. The mob began to arrive and demanded the policemen to bring them down, the two soldiers, they wanted to lynch them. But the Palestinian authority, a Palestinian policeman refused. Instead, they did the lynch themselves. They used any tool they found the police station, they used metal poles, sticks, knives, and guns, and for half an hour, they were stabbing and beating the soldiers to death. But the mob demanded blood. So the Palestinian policeman took one of the soldiers, Vadim Nurjic, and threw his body from the second floor into the crowd. And the mob took out the internal organs of the body. They ripped the body to shreds. They dragged it to the center of town and lit it on fire. 
we just finished law school. I was, um, I just got my license. I finished Bar Ilan University. My friends finished Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University. And we thought that in any other country in the world, the PA, the, the Palestinian, the, the policemen and the state would be found responsible for this horrible religion. It looked clear to us that the Palestinian Authority had to pay a lot of money for this murder. It also looked very clear to us that if we can start fighting back, and if we start bringing these terrorists to court and go after the funds and go after the money, perhaps we can take a role in the war against terrorism. Perhaps we can cut off the oxygen of the terrorism, which is the money. Perhaps if you stop the flow of the money, you'll be able to stop the flow of the terrorism. So we decided to sue the Palestinian Authority. We filed a lawsuit in the District Court of Jerusalem. And after that, we filed more cases against Iran, against Syria for funding terrorism, Hamas, Islamic Jihad. And in two years, we started winning in court. We won judgments for hundreds of millions of dollars. We inserted liens for tens of thousands of shekels. We got unprecedented judgments, unprecedented decisions. And then we were contacted by a secret unit in the Mossad, headed by Mayor Dagan, the former head of the Mossad. Its name was Harpoon. And its goal was to fight terror financing. They include representatives of the Mossad, of the Shabbat, of the IDF, of the Defense Ministry, of the Treasury. And they were sitting down and brainstorming and looking for ways to starve the terror organizations. They had one goal, follow the money, target the money, kill the money. It was a secret unit until we wrote a book about it. It's called Harpoon. And uh, they approached us and say, perhaps they can collaborate with us. Perhaps they can provide us with evidence that they concurred during their operations against banks, against the terror organizations. Evidence that prove where the money is coming from, where is it going? Perhaps we can extend our activity and go after the banks that provide financial services to the organizations, file more lawsuits against the Palestinian Authority that steered the Intifada. It was 2002, it was the peak of the Intifada. It was a Dolphinarium discotheque when 30 kids got killed and the uh, Moment Cafe, 18 people getting killed and the uh, Park Hotel in Natania, 30 guests over Passover Center getting killed. So we couldn't do it as private lawyers anymore. We opened Shurat Hadin Israel Law Center to take all these hundreds of cases and file them in orderly manner in the courts around the world. Since then, we are presenting hundreds of terror victims in lawsuits and legal actions against Hamas, Islamic Jihad, PLO, Hezbollah, against the Palestinian Authority, against Iran, Syria, North Korea, against Arab banks, European banks, um, Lebanese bank, Chinese banks fighting terrorism in court. And we've been successful. As a result of our cases, banks no longer agreed to open bank accounts to designated terror organizations. They don't agree to operate in terror zones like South Lebanon, like Gaza. And all this causes a great deal of harm to the terror organizations because they need money. Hamas in Gaza runs a government. They need hundreds of millions of dollars to provide to their population, to the prisoners that are sitting in the Israeli jail, to the military. Yes, they have soldiers. They pay them a salary on a monthly basis and to keep bringing ammunition and missiles and build tunnels in Gaza. Hamas budget spent today on half a billion dollars. And every time Hamas looks for a bank that will assist it, 
we go and file a lawsuit against this bank in the federal court in New York. Just recently, we had a case on behalf of Ella Bukasis. She was uh, 17 years old when she was walking one day with her brother, 15 years old. They came back from Bnei Akiva, it's a youth movement, in Sderot, when the red alert went off. This is the alarm that goes on when the missiles are foreign from Gaza. In Tel Aviv, we have 90 seconds to find a shelter. In Ashdod, which is a little bit southern than here, we have 60 seconds to find a shelter. And in Sterot, we have 15 seconds to find a shelter. So she was walking down the street. It was a bare street. There was no building, no bus to hide underneath them. The only thing that went into her mind is to protect her brother. She fell over her brother. She covered him. The missile fell right near their heads. Many shrapnels fell into them both hands. She fought for seven days on her life in the hospital. She died. Her brother is disabled for life. We are asked by Harpoon if we can file a lawsuit against a major bank that provided financial services to Hamas at the time. We agreed, we filed a case, and we recently won. So the father of Allah Bukasis called me up. He said, thank you for letting me fight back. Thank you for getting me my integrity back. I feel I'm no longer a victim. And this is what these cases do. They enable the victims to fight back. They bring them closure. They bring them justice. And we are able to win in the legal courtroom by blocking the funds from falling again to the hands of the organization. But today I would like to speak to you about recent struggle that we are involved with, which is a real threat to the state of Israel. Because you see, we are able to win in court. We got $2 billion in judgment. We um, put a lien on $600 million. We are able to take $300 million from the terror organizations. We do it in the private Court. And Israel do it in the military. They fight back. And the terror organizations realize that they cannot win Israel militarily. But despite the wars they launch against us and the horrific wave of terrorism they unleashed against us, we are still here. They started using a different type of weapon, a non conventional one, but a very devastating one. It's called BDS and law firm. BDS, as we all know, stands for boycott sanctions and divestments. They call to boycott Israel, to sanction it, to divest from it. They alien it. They call it apartheid states. They want to find a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but it's not a two-state solution. They call all the refugees from 1948. There were 600,000 of them back then. Today, there are 5 million to come back to Israel to settle in it under the slogan, let demography win. They want to replace the Jewish state with a Palestinian one. And they use all type of tactics. One of them is law. They went and told the Palestinian Authority, there is a new way to fight Israel, which is the International Criminal Court. Let's fight them legally. And what the Palestinians did, following their advice, they went to the UN in 2012 and upgraded their status to an observer state. The reason they did it is because this enables them to sign the Rome Treaty and to become a member in the International Criminal Court. In 2015, they threatened Israel that if they don't agree to their demands, they will go to the International Criminal Court and file war complaints against Israel. And they did. They signed the Rome Treaty, 
they joined the court as members, and they started flooding the court with evidence against Israel. They had two allegations. One, that the IDF is using excessive force against Palestinians. they causing death of innocent Palestinians, civilians from the Palestinian Authority. This is a violation of the international law. Their other allegation is a settlement. They claim that Israel, by building settlements in the West Bank, violates the international law. As soon as we saw that in Shurat Adin, we knew that Israel will not be able to take part in this fight. Israel does not recognize the court. Israel is not joining the court as a state member. Israel knows exactly what type of court is this. But we couldn't leave the court open only to the side of the Palestinians. We needed to bring our version. So we decided to go into court and flood it with our own evidence. Because who's the real war criminal in this conflict? It's not the IDF. It's not the IDF that puts a legal advisor in each and every tank and advise the Air Force how to strike and where to strike. It's not the IDF that risks their own life going into civil areas and trying to get the terrorists by hand instead of just shooting from the air or bombing from the air. It's not the idea who really cares about civilian life. It's the other side. If the suicide bombing, the drive-by shooting is shooting thousands of missiles towards Israeli population, not from recent years, but back then, from 2002, from the beginning of the Intifada, we went and filed war complaints against the leaders of Hamas, of the Palestinian Authority, of the Islamic Jihad, not based on the fact that the Palestinians is a state, because the Palestinian Authority is not a state, they don't have a right to join the court, but based on the citizenship of these people, these individuals, because they are all Jordanian citizenship citizens. And Jordan is a state member from day one. So we can come with clean hands to the court and say, if you want to deal with this conflict, go after the real war criminals, not based on the jurisdiction, the fake one that the Palestinian Authority forces to take, but based on the Jordanian citizenship of these terrorists. The other allegation is a little bit more complicated. Palestinian claim that Israel violates Section 49 to the Geneva Convention by building settlements in Judea and Samaria. The Geneva Convention was enacted after World War II, after Nazi Germany took over parts of Eastern Europe and did a massive population transfer into this area. The Geneva Convention rules that a country is prohibited from moving its population into occupied territories that it conquered. Palestinians claim that Israel, by moving its population to live in Judea and Samaria, violated Section 49 of the Geneva Convention because the territories are occupied. Israel has a great defense. The territories are not occupied. In order to occupy a territory, you have to take it from someone who owns it. And nobody owns Judea and Samaria. The last ones that had any ownership on this area were the Turks under the Ottoman Empire. But in 1917, in World War I, Britain came, took over this land, and received a mandate to administrate it. Note, it was an ownership. It was a mandate to administrate these territories. But then after 25 years, the British left. They gave up. They saw that the parties are fighting against each other, the Jews, the Arabs, they're killing each other. Sometimes they're killing the British too. So they left. And in 1948, the independence war broke out. It lasted a year and a half. 
and ended with a ceasefire. The ceasefire, the boundaries of the ceasefire, where the leagues of the Jews and the Arabs settled, was drawn in a green ink. And this is why it's called the Green Line. And it had no political meaning, no political implication. It's just the line where the parties landed. But Jordan, who saw that was a very nice piece of land attached to its boundaries, annexed it, even gave it a name, the West Bank. But nobody recognizes annexation. No country except for two, Britain and Pakistan that had a great relationship with King Abdullah. Even the Arab League was furious at Jordan for taking this unilateral act. And in 1988, Jordan gave up its right for these territories. So in 1967, when Israel took over these territories, nobody owned it. It was no one land. So the most you can say about these territories is that they are uh, disputed territories. But they're not occupied. However, Israel is not there to raise its defense. And even if they did, the court will not agree. We all know what Europe thinks about the territories. They consider them to be occupied. Therefore, the Palestinian raising this allegation against Israel will be a game changer against Israel. Israel we lose. So we were thinking, what can we do? And we realized that Israel is not the only country in the world to be blamed for occupying territories. Turkey occupies Northern Cyprus. Morocco occupies Western Sahara. Russia occupies Georgia. So we went and filed a work on complaint against Turkey for occupying Northern Cyprus. And on a 30 page long brief, we detail what Israel is doing in Northern Cyprus, what Turkey is doing in Northern Cyprus, how they build hospitals, how they build universities, how they give tax incentives to their residents, their citizens to go and live in Northern Cyprus. Exactly what Israel is doing in the West Bank. We figured that the court will not indict Turkey. The court will say it's not in their hands to deal with this dispute. They're not getting involved. It's for the countries to resolve it among each other. So when the court will come and deal with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, their hands will be tied. There will be a president saying that the court is not getting involved in such dispute over land. Last month, the court decided they are opening an investigation against Israel based on these two allegations. They gave Israel a chance to participate in this procedure. Israel declined. Israel said that they have their own court system. They don't need the International Criminal Court in the Hague to be a super, super court over Israel legal system, and they are not going to play their game. So we in Shuradadin are fighting back. We're flooding the court with evidence against the Palestinians. We are pursuing our complaints against Turkey and other countries in the world because we have to deter the court from getting into this issue. And we have to deter the Palestinian Authority from getting and pushing the court to go forward. Because the court in very absurd way, decided that they are investigating Israel, they are investigating Hamas, but they are not investigating the Palestinian Authority. They are immune. So we come to court and say no. The Palestinian Authority, who encourage terrorism, who abhor terrorism, who pays money in the pay to slave policy, to prisoners, to terrorists, to their family, is not immune. They have to be investigated. We have to win this procedure. We cannot let the court go after our IDF soldiers. 
We cannot have them issue arrest warrants against our soldiers, against our officials. We have to fight them back. Not going to be the first time Geraldine is fighting back in the courts, defending IDF soldiers and defending the rights of the state of Israel. And just last victory that we had, it was a case against the Palestinian Authority that we filed back then in 2004. And after 11 years, it went to trial. It was a case on behalf of 10 families that lost their, their siblings in terror attacks, which were done by Palestinian authorities' employees, you know, uh, Palestinian policemen, Palestinian security guards, um, PLO officials. We came and said these are workers of the Palestinian Authority. They get their salary, they get their um, authorization from the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority has to pay. The trial opened in 2011, January. It was a jury trial, and the Palestinian Authority had a defense. They said, indeed, they were our employees, but they were wrong employees. They did the attacks after work hours. It wasn't our policy to kill Israelis. We didn't authorize anyone to kill Jews. But when the trial opened, they found it hard to explain the jury. If they were wrong employees, how do you keep paying their salary until today? How do you keep paying the prisoners who are sitting in the Israeli jail, the one who is responsible for this horrible terror attacks, a salary? You keep promoting them every three years. You pay stipends to the families of the suicide bombers. You call town squares and uh, soccer games on the names of the suicide bombers. This is not how you treat wrong employees. This is not where your policy is against killing Jews. There was no surprise there. Then when the jury came back, they found the Palestinian Authority responsible for all 24 acts of terrorism and gave us a judgment against them for $655 million. The Palestinian Authority was in shock. They fired their DC law firm. They hired a new one from New York and filed an appeal. In the United States, in order to file an appeal, you have to pass a bond for the entire amount of the law of the judgment. The Palestinian Authority came and said, we don't have $655 million to pass as a bond. They reached out to the State Department for help, and the State Department helped. It was under Obama administration. They came and said, um, the State Department came and said that the Palestinian Authority is a national um, security asset in the, in the Middle East. They wanted to keep to the side of the Israeli state. They don't want the Palestinian Authority to go on bankrupt. They asked the court to be considerate. And the court was, Instead of $655 million, the court imposed only $10, $10 million bond. Now the uh, way of the Palestinian Authority was open to come and argue its appeal. They didn't argue against the jury verdict, against the evidence, against the expert we brought in the case, against the testimony of the victims. They had only one argument, one technical argument personal jurisdiction. They came and said the Palestinian Authority is not present in the United States. They don't run business in the United States. They don't have representation in the United States. There is no personal jurisdiction. The Court of Appeals had a dilemma. Because on one hand, we filed this case based on the Anti-Terrorism Act, a law that allows victims of terrorism that were killed or injured abroad to bring their case in the United States. It's an extraterritorial jurisdiction law. On the other hand, there is the 
American Constitution. You need due process. You need personal jurisdiction. But having in front of them the letter of the State Department saying, in other words, whatever you impose the Palestinian Authority to pay, they don't have the money to pay. The Court of Appeal went and made the judgments. We didn't stop. We went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, knowing that there is a new hero that didn't know Joseph, as the State Department now under Trump administration, if they agree to the interpretation of the law, and the State Department case that came and said, yes, the law is unconstitutional. You need personal jurisdiction. The Supreme Court rejected our read. But we didn't stop there. We went to Congress and told them that there is a problem. There is a problem because we filed this case back then in 2004 based on a law that they enacted. This was a very well-intended law, but now the court found it unconstitutional. We litigated it for 15 years and they have to solve the problem. And the way for them to solve the problem is to reinstate personal jurisdiction. To come and say that if the Palestinian Authority want to continue to receive aid from the United States government, they have to agree to litigate these cases in the American courts. And Congress agreed. They changed the law. They reinstated personal jurisdiction. Trump signed off on the law. And now the Palestinian Authority is back in court. We are back before the federal court in New York, litigating this case for the Palestinian Authority to come and prove that there is no personal jurisdiction and for us to come and say, oh yes, there is. The Palestinian Authority receives funds from the United States and they have to litigate this case. In the end, we'll make the Palestinian Authority pay $655 million to terror victims. Until then, the Palestinian Authority realized that the little support they gave the terrorists before the attack, the weapon they provided them, the safe haven they gave them before the attack, turned in the end of the day to hundreds of millions of dollars in damages. This is a, only a portion of the cases we're litigating in Israel, United States, Canada, Europe. Every day we get more calls from more and more terror victims who want to fight back, who don't want to be victims anymore. And every day there is a new challenge that the Israeli government is facing. The state of Israel is under threat from, that the answer for it is in the legal theater. And we are there to help. Ratadin is a non for profit organization that will keep fighting terrorism and keep fighting Israel's enemies in the courts around the world. We do it because the Israeli government cannot do what we do. The Israeli government's hands are tied. They have restrictions, they have interests, they have political considerations, they have to be politically correct. We don't. We are a private organization and represent private people that have one goal, to bankrupt terrorism, one lawsuit at a time. And we will do it because we don't have any other choice. This is our country, the only country, and we want to live here safely. We want to raise our children and let them go to school freely and happily and walk the street of Jerusalem or Tel Aviv without fear. This is our country, and we will fight because we're fighting for our national survival. Yes, it will be a long battle. It will be a very hard one. It will be an uphill battle, but in the end, we will win. I assure you, we will win. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Nitsana. We have a few minutes uh, for questions. So if you have not yet uh, sent me a question, feel free to send me over a question in the chat, but I'll start with uh, one question 
um, about uh, the International Criminal Court. So the State of Israel, as I understand it, uh, is not going to be involved uh, directly in that in that investigation um, and in any in, you know trials that, that may go on. What does that mean um, for Israel? Uh, you know, if Israel is found guilty of war crimes, what what would that mean for the state? So Israel itself will not be indicted. You don't indict a state. You do indict the individuals. The court already is looking for names of officers of soldiers that are involved in the alleged war crimes. Incidents that happened in protective aid operation, incidents that happened during the March of Return in 2018 when Hamas riots on the border of Gaza and sent children to the border of Gaza and those were hurt by the IDF forces. They will demand, the court will demand Israel to expedite these officials to their hands, Israel will refuse, and then the court will issue arrest warrants against the IDF soldiers, their officers, and any other officials that the court would love to. Um, these arrest warrants will become international. There are 120 state members in the court which will honor these arrest warrants, and there is a big fear that the IDF soldiers without their knowledge will be arrested all of a sudden in the airport around the world. In addition, Israel will be under sanctions. Israel not collaborating with the court will be put under pressure, might be boycott El Al, our national airline will not be able to fly to different countries. There will be economic pressure uh, put on Israel. So, if this investigation will run, Israel will have huge problems dealing with it. This is why Israel is looking all over for help. We trusted United States to be our ally in this battle. Unfortunately, President Biden canceled all the sanctions that President Trump took um, the court with. Uh, and just let Israel dealing with it uh, herself. Uh, Europe is not strong enough to hold against the court. There are some countries that are standing to the side of Israel, but only few. It will be a very, very hard battle. Israel will continue its diplomatic struggle, and we will continue our legal one. Thank you for that. Um... Another question uh, that's being asked um, is, what activities do you currently have investigating or bringing litigation against Hamas? They have the, uh, the whole thing in March of the Living, in March of the uh, Return. Uh, in 2018, Hamas decided that they are um, going to riot uh, into Israel and uh, infiltrate the border and go their plan was to kidnap Israeli citizens, Israeli soldiers, or carry out uh, uh, terror attacks inside Israel. But they were very afraid to go on their own. So what they did, knowing that the IDF is a moral military, uh, send their kids, send five years old, seven years old, up to 18 years old, straight to the border, they pushed the children to go in. They told them, don't look back. They told, they provided them with weapons, with all type of knife and cutter and, and poles, and just pushed them to the border. And Israel warned um, both Hamas and the children not to uh, get near it. And uh, whoever crossed the border, whoever jumped over the fence or made a cut in the fence, was shot, usually in the leg, but some. Uh, were uh, uh, harmed uh, as well. This is a war crime. Why it's a war crime on behalf of Hamas? Because you are not allowed to use children under 15 years old in your military operations. You cannot use civilians dressed as civilian in your military acts. In order to fight, you have to wear signia, you, wear, you have to uh, act from a war zone to let your enemy know exactly where to hit. Otherwise, your enemy might hit populated areas, as happens. 
Hamas is um, shooting missiles against Israel, thousands of missiles on daily, sometimes uh, uh, even often, more often against Israeli citizens. This is a war crime, it's called genocide. You cannot shoot missiles towards Israeli citizens. And if we go back from the beginning of the Intifada, from the year of 2002, we list all the suicide bombings, all the buses that Hamas blew up. The Dolphinarium, as I mentioned, the Park Hotel, the Moment Cafe, the Subaru attack. You remember these names? We remember them very, very well. And the court will get to know them as well. I think we have time for two last questions. Um, first, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, your work fighting hate and terror in the social media realm, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube? So in recent years, there is the, a phenomenon called the lone wolf, right? Individuals in Israel, it's Palestinians, in other countries are extreme Muslims that go grab a knife, and kill innocent people. And when you dive into these incidents and you look for a reason, what goes a young man, usually they're 15 years old, 16 years old, 19 years old, to go to their mother's kitchen, grab a knife and go and kill a Jew or a Christian or any other uh, civilian, you understand that they are incited to murder, incited to kill, incitement that takes place in the social media. In Israel, it's Facebook. Facebook is the most popular um, social media network among the Palestinians. And you'll find like hundreds of thousands of posts encouraging terrorism, teaching how to kill, videos illustrating where to step, how to step, how to twist the knife and all kinds of other. We wanted to put an end to this phenomenon and we went to brought a lawsuit against Facebook, which was the first one, on behalf of um, victims of terrorism that were uh, killed by knife attacks in Israel or by car running attacks. We filed it for $1 billion in New York and Facebook had a defense. Facebook said that they are immune according to the Communication Decency Act. This is the law from 1996 that Congress legislated in order to keep the internet open. And it grants blanket immunity to social media networks. Everyone can put anything they want on their social media and the social media will be. So there is a, a big question a big question that will resolve only the Supreme Court because it's a balance between two laws. One, the Anti-Terrorism Act. In the United States, no American company is allowed to provide any sort of services to a designated organization. Bank cannot open a bank account to a designated organization. They cannot open a bank account to Nasser, uh, to um, Nasrallah or to uh, Khaled Mash'al or any of the series. So why the social media, why Facebook is allowed to open a page for Khaled Mash'al? Or Twitter is allowed to open an account for the uh, head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. This is one law. On the other hand, there is a communication this is the act. It just grants them immunity. Everything to do with content, everything to do with posts is immune. And I come to court and say, I don't really care what Hamas is putting on their uh, Facebook page. They can write that the IDF is the most moral country in the world. They can put flowers and butterflies on their page. The mere fact that Hamas has a Facebook page is a violation of the act, is a violation of the Anti-Terrorism Act. Nobody can give any material support to a designated organization. But again, it's a, it's a question of interpretation of the law and uh, it's going to the Supreme Court right now. If we lose these cases, we are going to the 
uh, Congress and would like to um, and would like to have them uh, in legislation come and say that the Anti-Terrorism Act governs the Communications Act. And in case of terrorism, there is an exception because you cannot give immunity for terrorism. You have to make sure that the internet will be terror-free. You have to have a mission of zero tolerance terrorism on the internet. Thank you, Nitsana. In the last minute we have together, I just wanted to ask you, you know, we've talked a lot about the challenges um, and, the, and the victories that you've had as well. What gives you hope for the months and years ahead? Um, well, my hope is that uh, Israel's citizens, the, Israel, the, the people in Israel will live safely in a secured Israel. We, you know, all had dreams for peace. We want everyone to love each other, but unfortunately it's not really working. We gave it a try 25 years ago when the Israeli government signed the Oslo Agreement. They gave a chance to the Palestinian Authority to become an entity. They plan to give them an autonomy but they fail. And until the Palestinian Authority will create and grow a new leadership, perhaps a young one, a clean one, not corrupt, the one that cares about the population, there will be no negotiation or partnership with the Palestinian Authority. And therefore, what's left for Israel is to make sure that the people are living safely in their country. We have so many threats. Iran nuclear plan, Syria from the north, Hamas from the south. Even Jordan is unstable in recent months. Europe is not in love with Israel. The anti-Semitism in Europe is just thriving. And the campuses in the United States are full of BDS activists. But because we believe in our right to live in the land of Israel. And because we believe this is an historic right, we just keep it, stay in it, do anything we have to do in order to keep living in our country. And with God's help, we will just prevail. Nitsana, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. I wanna thank everyone for joining us, uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, you can find the link to Harpoon on the side. And obviously also please check out the work that Sana does with Shura Tadin. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much.